Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Emmy Grimes. I'm an educator and advisor here at Synergy Medical Group. We have our amazing one and only Dr. Jerry Tennant speaking to you today. He is going to be discussing fatigue and fibromyalgia and how to keep our bodies healthy in those scenarios and what to do in general for that. So I'm very excited about this conversation today. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jerry Tennant. Thanks, Amy. I appreciate it. I always begin my uh, talks by noting that I'm speaking with my Arizona MDH license and not my Texas MD license. Uh, because of the restrictions placed on uh, Texas physicians about things that they can, can and cannot discuss. So one of the things I'd like to just point out so I don't forget it is that right now there is a lot of, of confusion and anxiety about various infections uh, going around. Um, those that we normally think about and of course the newer ones. Um, there is an interesting technology about the way that the universe actually cleans itself. And according to the fellow that invented the device I'm about to mention to you, uh, the universe uses a seven step process in order to create what's necessary to keep the universe uh, cleaner of uh, infections. And so he eventually figured out how to do that and put it in a box. And so the difference between this technology and most uh, things that try to clean the air around you is that most devices that try to clean air either run it through a filter that tries to simply capture the microorganisms as it blows through the filters, or that there's some other similar technology that where you're sucking air through a device and uh, trying to destroy the microorganisms as it goes through. This device, on the other hand, creates what are called hydroxyl groups, which is a OH minus. And the, the hydroxyl groups have the ability to eliminate uh, most any infectious organism and uh, also is very good at uh, eliminating odors. Um, so um, the device is called Odorox, O-D-O-R-O-X, Odorox. So um, what this device does is it actually sprays, if you please, emits hydroxyl groups into the room and those uh, not only clean the air then, but to clean all of the surfaces that it lands on. The device has been tested it with various microbiology labs. And so if you look at the, the website, you can find all of these uh, certified tests and it's my understanding that uh, this device has is also uh, now being used to sterilize uh, surgery rooms uh, where surgery is performed. So at my home and at my clinic, we run these devices uh, every day so that basically we're living in a sterile environment. So for those of you who are apprehensive about various kinds of infections or if you have a low immune system and you're prone to, uh, to infections, et cetera, you might want to investigate and educate yourself about these devices and uh, consult with the people at Synergy Medical Group about them because they can educate you more than what I've spoken at the moment. But it gives me personally great comfort to know every day when I go to work, I'm working in a sterile environment because, you know, most physicians' offices have people who are sick coming and going all the time. And the fact that I know that we can keep our entire office uh, uh, 99 percent sterile is a great comfort to me so um, the uh, subject that I wanted to discuss today is one that has uh, been sort of a conundrum for physicians for many years and that's what's called chronic fatigue syndrome and also is uh, you can kind of dump into that same basket fibromyalgia etc so for the longest time, uh, the particularly insurance companies and medical societies and boards, et cetera, said there's no such thing as chronic fatigue syndrome and no such thing as fibromyalgia. And yet patients would uh, tell you uh, quite the contrary. 
Now, one of the problems, of course, is that the traditional way of, of managing patients uh, today is that patient comes in and almost no matter what they complain of, the physician will do a cursory physical uh, and then order lab tests. So you get what's called a comprehensive metabolic profile, a complete blood uh, count and a urinalysis, and maybe a few other tests. And when all of those come back normal, the physician says, well, there's nothing wrong with you. And the patient says, but doctor, I hurt all the time. I, I'm so tired all the time. I, I, I can't function. There's got to be something wrong. So the physician then says, well, this is probably emotional. Here, take these antidepressant uh, drugs and uh, uh, I'll see you next year. Or if the case is worse, then they refer them to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, uh, assuming that all of this symptomatology is emotionally based. Well, this kind of medicine makes the assumption that if you have something wrong with you, it's going to show up in blood tests. And that's simply an assumption because there are uh, oftentimes, uh, in fact, the majority of people that I see in my clinic have normal blood tests and normal urine tests, etc. And yet they are uh, anywhere from uh, um, uncomfortable to disabled. And of course, this leads one to the understanding that when you say I'm tired all the time, you're basically saying that, that I don't have energy. And so once we start using the word energy instead of tired, it begins to make us realize that we're talking about voltage. And so um, it's not uncommon for me to see a person who has normal blood tests, but their total body voltage, which should be 25 millivolts, is maybe two millivolts or four millivolts. And once you see the voltage uh, being so low, it becomes obvious to you why this person is having symptoms and having trouble getting through the day. So I've spent the last 20 years talking about the importance of voltage in the body. And um, only slowly now, are, uh, I think, are more and more people beginning to realize that to really understand health and physiology, you have to understand physics instead of just chemistry. Um, I've spoken many times about the fact that if two uh, hydro hydrogen atoms want to get together with an oxygen to form water, the first thing they do is exchange electrons. Well, the exchange of electrons is physics, not chemistry. And so basically we need to shift from a chemistry centric philosophy of medicine to a physics uh, centric philosophy of medicine. If we're going to really understand how the body works and what to do about it to make it work correctly. So of course, um, most of my lectures, including these uh, that uh, you're watching now have been focused on trying to understand the role of uh, voltage in the body because it controls essentially everything. And so <clears throat> I wanted to point out uh, another problem with uh, this paradigm, and that is most people have this idea that, that if you simply um, spend a day or two uh, looking at what's going on with your voltage, that suddenly you'll be well and stay well. Well, it simply isn't the case. And also what I often see is people come and they say, well, I tried chiropractic, it made me a little better, but it didn't last. I tried acupuncture, it made me a little better, but it didn't last. I tried essential oils, it made me better, but it didn't last. I tried it said, and go keep going down the list of all these various forms of medicine uh, that seem to make people a little better, but they don't last. So, People are always searching for that magic uh, potion that's going to make everything okay. And that's all that they have to do. And they can go on about their business as usual and uh, be well, just as long as they keep taking this, I like to call it the South African jungle juice that everybody's looking for, uh, but doesn't exist. 
So whether you're talking about vitamin C, whether you're talking about various essential oils, whether you're talking about uh, various homeopathics, whether you're talking about whatever, there really isn't a magic bullet. So I compare it to uh, having a home that has been blown down by either a tornado or a hurricane and you have to rebuild it. So you can't build that home back with doorknobs and bathroom tiles. Those are important to, if you're going to have a totally functional home, but you can't build a home with just those things. So the idea that you can find some magic potion that will rebuild your house, namely your body, uh, and that's all that you need is simply uh, wrong. It's simply going to lead you down a path where nothing really good happens. Not only do you have to have all the things that it takes to make new cells, but you have to have them all at the same time. So uh, one of the problems I've had over the 20 years I've been doing this kind of medicine is that I'll recommend that people need to do this and this and this and this. So they'll come back later and I'll say, well, are you still doing this and this and this? No, I just wanted to do them one at a time so I'd know which one worked. So I didn't have to do them all. Well, the problem is that just one of them doesn't work. Again, you will not find a single magic bullet that makes everything work. You have to, to realize that the body functions with cells and that every cell has to have a variety of things in order for it to work properly and not just one thing. So the, you'll never find the elusive magic bullet. Now, <clears throat> the, um, the, the issue then is also that you have to, uh, if you're really going to uh, be able to resolve these uh, various issues uh, with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, you have to realize that you can confirm that somebody has that basically by measuring their total body voltage and in the voltage in every different circuit. And then you'll begin to understand, you'll have the data that says, yeah, this is what's going on with this person. Uh, they have the fatigue because guess what? They don't have the voltage. They don't have the juice. Uh, you know, I often tell people that not too far from my office, there's a General Motors Cadillac plant that makes Cadillacs. But if the power to that plant is switched off, guess what? No matter how many parts they have uh, in store, they're not going to be making any Cadillacs. You have to have the power for things to work. And so again, uh, I have to emphasize over and over that people who have chronic illness always have lost uh, some of the voltage or they don't have adequate voltage in whatever circuit supplies that particular organ or organs that are malfunctioning. So the basics of this then, as we've discussed in some of uh, my other conversations with you, is that one can uh, measure the various muscle battery packs in the body. Uh, and a muscle battery pack or a stack of muscle batteries is what's been called an acupuncture meridian. So every organ in the body has its own power pack. And if you want to know why that organ isn't working, go measure its power pack and you will uh, essentially always find that it, there's inadequate voltage in it. And so one of the things you want to do then is ask the question, well, why did this particular power pack lose its voltage? And again, as I've discussed many times, if you take any rechargeable battery and you drain it all the way to zero, it flips its polarity upside down. So if you take a rechargeable battery and you put it upside down in a battery charger, it will not take a charge. And so it is with the human body. When you have drained a muscle battery back all the way to zero, it's going to be incapable then of holding the charge and whatever organs are on that particular circuit are beginning to begin to malfunction. They can try to borrow voltage from other circuits that are working but that's sort of like depending on your next door neighbor to give you three meals a day. Mm -hmm. It'll help you for a little while, but eventually that also uh, wears thin and pretty soon you, you don't have the voltage for that to work and then you're in big trouble. Now, as I've discussed in other lectures, we've identified five different reasons that um, muscle battery packs lose their charge, not enough thyroid hormone, 
scars across the circuit, dental infections in the circuit, emotions, uh, because emotions can block circuits, and finally various toxins. So the, the next thing I would like to encourage you to think about is that the amount of, of oxygen that will dissolve in a liquid is dictated in part by the voltage of the liquid. And because our cells are about 70 to 90% water, as voltage drops in a cell, the oxygen goes away. Well, as oxygen goes away, a lot of bad things begin to happen. Um, one of the things that uh, you should recognize is that lack of oxygen in tissue is one of the uh, prominent reasons that tissue becomes painful. So anywhere from an ache to an actual hurting is generally associated with lack of oxygen in the tissue. And so if you don't have voltage, then you don't have oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, then things begin to hurt. And now we end up with what one can call fibromyalgia. So again, if you're going to correct the oxygen levels, you have to correct the voltage if you're going to keep it normal. And in a previous uh, talk, I talked to you about oxygen and how the body manages that. And so uh, I'd encourage you to review that if you don't remember how that works. Then in addition, as um, oxygen levels drop, one of the things that happens is that various microorganisms show up. That is to say that the body contains perhaps a trillion different uh, kinds of, of microorganisms, or we can call them bugs. And when the oxygen drops, the bugs wake up and they want to have lunch and they want to have you for lunch. And since they don't have teeth to take a bite out of your tissue, they put out digestive enzymes to dissolve your cells so they can get the nutrients. But of course, as those toxins or digestive enzymes are dissolving your cells, that also becomes painful. And so because of you have the increased uh, toxins that are put out by the microorganisms. And so um, one wants to uh, eliminate these microorganisms. And one of the problems that, that exists about them is that as voltage and oxygen drops, uh, particularly bacteria shed their cell membranes and they become cell wall deficient organisms or what light at the University of Chicago calls stealth pathogens. For anyone particularly interested in this subject, I would encourage you to get Dr. Madman's uh, book called Stealth Pathogens and read about it because uh, it's not commonly uh, thought about or understood in, in traditional medicine about what happens to microorganisms as they begin to lose their cell membranes. And of course, one of the problems when they lose their cell membranes is they become invisible to the immune system. So the immune system can't find them. And so they're out there doing their mischief, putting out uh, enzymes dissolving your tissue. Uh, but your, your immune system, your white blood cells, your uh, antibodies and so forth, can't see them, can't find them. And so uh, the lower the voltage goes, the lower the oxygen goes, the lower the oxygen goes, the more these bugs show up and the more pathogenic they become. So one can see these uh, microorganisms if you use either a phase contrast or a dark field microscope, but those are rarely used in hospitals or physicians offices for some reason. So most physicians in hospital labs and so forth use just a bright light microscope and the microscopes that are used with bright light, uh, the light has to shine uh, uh, through the microorganism and the micro in order to see the microorganism, they use stains of various kinds of dyes to make them show up. But the problem is those dyes uh, generally ha are designed to uh, attach to cell membranes. And if there's no cell membrane there, they don't get dyed, you don't see them. There are other microscopes that have various technologies uh, that uh, handles the light going through in a different way. And those are called phase contrast or dark field microscopes. And with those, because the way the light is, uh, is shined through the specimen, you can actually see them. So for example, you may uh, be in a, 
uh, room with the lights on and you don't see anything in the air, um, or you go outside on a foggy night and you don't really see the fog, but if you turn on a beam of light, then the stuff that's in the air uh, scatters the light and you can see it. Well, that's the basic philosophy or the basic mechanism by which these spatial microscopes allow you to actually see these various infectious organisms. Now, once you see them, uh, what are you going to do about it? Well, antibiotics don't work because antibiotics primarily work on cell membranes. And if a bug doesn't have a cell membrane, it's not going to work against it. And in fact, it's been shown that if you want to try to culture these uh, microorganisms that have lost their cell membranes, the only way that they will grow in a culture is if you add antibiotics. So giving somebody who has low voltage and low oxygen antibiotics often makes it worse because it allows those bugs that are attacking you to grow even faster and become more toxic. So what to do about them? Well, the, you can eliminate subalt deficient organisms with what are called oxidative therapies. And the oxidative therapies include uh, ozone, hydrogen peroxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide's cousin called chlorine dioxide, and vitamin C actually works as an oxidative therapy. Uh, the other way you can, can do it is with frequencies. So every different microorganism, in fact, every different atom and every different molecule on the planet has its own specific frequency or frequencies that are characteristic. And so if you know what that frequency is and you send it uh, out, then it causes that microorganism uh, to begin to uh, to vibrate from its resonant frequency to the point that eventually it explodes. Uh, so this technology of using frequencies to deal with microorganisms dates all the way back to the 1930s and uh, yet was uh, suppressed through most of the years uh, since then until just last year, a major medical school published in, uh, actually it was on the front page of one of the, of the uh, magazines that people get. I've forgotten whether it was Time or Life or something. Anyway, one of the magazines front page was uh, this quote, new technology where you use frequencies to kill infections. So things have, are starting to come around again, but it is a methodology in which you can both identify and deal with these microorganisms. So let me try to put some of this together. When voltage drops for whatever reason, and again, we've identified five different reasons. When the voltage drops and you can't recharge that circuit, then you're going to have a lack of the energy for the cells to work. And you're also going to have lack of oxygen, which is necessary for the metabolism of cells. And one of the results of lack of oxygen is that things begin to hurt and infections show up. And then the toxins from the infections uh, lower the voltage more, which lowers the oxygen more, which makes things even worse. And so it's a vicious cycle. And so in uh, order to deal with that, you need to identify the circuits that are uh, have lost their voltage and begin to correct it. So you correct it by correcting the five different things that we've mentioned. And of course, one of the th technologies that we've developed in order to make this happen faster is to use the biomodulator and the biotransducer. Um, so that uh, the, you need both of these devices because you have to flip the polarity of the battery back to normal so it'll take a charge. Otherwise, if you just try to charge it, it won't take a charge and it doesn't help. So you use scalar energy, which we'll talk about in another lecture. Uh, scalar has the ability to flip the polarity back to normal. So you use the biotransducer to flip the polarities back to normal. And then you use the electromagnetic energy of the biomodulator to recharge the battery pack. So you use the technologies, to get the, the thing working again, and then you go down the list of why it happened in the first place and correct all of those. Because if you don't correct all of those, it'll just happen again. And then once you re have restored the voltage, 
You also want to pay attention to what's going on with the oxygen. And normally, if you just correct the voltage, the oxygen will eventually correct itself. But if you want to make things happen faster, then you use things like hyperbaric oxygen um, in order to get oxygen into the tissue uh, faster and make the healing process occur quicker uh, as you're working on fixing the voltage. And then you can also uh, make things happen faster and make things feel better quicker by addressing the various infections. And uh, one can actually uh, figure out by uh, testing against frequencies which infections are active and then what to do to get rid of them. Uh, now, uh, one of the common infections that shows up in people is Lyme disease. Again, Lyme disease is an interesting phenomenon in this country. If you go back about oh, 10 years or so, maybe a little bit more, um, any physician that claimed that a person had Lyme disease and that they uh, could do something about it often lost the, their license. This is particularly rampant in the, in the New England area. For some reason, the medical boards were very aggressive in, in that particular part of the country but even in other states about uh, removing physicians' licenses who said that they uh, were in the, in the process of treating Lyme disease. So one can wonder why that was happening. Uh, and there is at least circumstantial evidence that Lyme, the Lyme bacteria was developed as a biological weapon um, by the Germans and then brought to the U.S. to Plum Island. And if you want to read about it, you can look it up about Plum Island and how that relates to Lyme disease. Uh, but the particular microorganism that causes Lyme disease and it's associated often, to, there are other bugs that are often associated with it, um, have, a, uh, have the ability to cause essentially any symptom that is known to afflict humans. So if you want to know what symptoms Lyme disease can cause, pick up any medical textbook and go to its index and there's a list of it, uh, in the index of what things Lyme disease can do. Now Lyme particularly likes the brain and the heart, but again, it can affect any organ and organism. Now, originally it was thought that Lyme disease only occurred when you got a bit by a tick from a deer but it's been shown that actually uh, Lyme disease microorganisms are airborne. Uh, it's transmitted exactly the same way as cold and flu, and that is through droplets in the air. So if I had a magic wand and waved it over you and eliminated every Lyme bacteria in the body, um, then the next time you go to the mall and somebody in the next aisle over sneezes, the, or they uh, have it and uh, punch the button on the elevator and then you come behind them and punch the button. Now you've got it too. Uh, you've got it back again. So the difference between people who have the Lyme bacteria in their body and those who have symptoms from it is again, is does the environment of the body allow it to uh, exist and thrive? So if you have normal voltage, normal oxygen, normal immune system, then the bugs are suppressed. The Lyme bugs are suppressed. But if you uh, happen to have a circuit or more with low voltage and low oxygen, then again, it's likely that you're going to have the Lyme uh, microorganism. Now, one of the problems with Lyme disease is that the blood tests that we have for it often miss it. Uh, they either don't see it or they, uh, they'll, they, the blood tests are delayed by about six months uh, after what's happening uh, in the person uh, that you're testing. And so our tests for Lyme disease are very uh, suspect. And just because you get tests that comes back and says you don't have it, doesn't mean that you don't have it. Now, again, if we go back to Lyda Matman's work at the uh, University of Chicago, Matman uh, recognized that the Lyme bacteria is a cousin to the syphilis bacteria, the both spirochetes. And back in 
you know, 50 some years ago when I was in medical school, we still had syphilis in Texas and the test that was considered the gold standard for it was the fluorescent antibody test. So one would take uh, the fluorescent uh, tagged antibodies and mix it with the blood. And if you had the syphilis bacteria, you, you could see it glow in your microscope. Well, Dr. Matman developed the same test for Lyme disease. And uh, th that allowed then us to then have a test that uh, actually worked for Lyme disease. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, government has never seen fit to approve that test. Now, if you go back about 10 or more years ago, there was a general practice a physician in Florida who herself had Lyme disease, and she began to use the fluorescent antibody test that Mattman developed. And one could send uh, specimens to her uh, for testing, which I did on a large number of my patients. And essentially, all of them came back positive. But uh, this physician would actually send me a, a photograph taken through the microscope so she could actually visualize the fact that the bugs were there. You could see them. Well, unfortunately, the government closed her down and made her quit doing the test. So you don't have a place to do that test anymore. But the point I'm making is that the majority of people in the United States carry the Lyme bacteria, uh, and it, uh, even if they haven't been bitten by anything, because again, it's airborne. So uh, the, one can generally make the assumption that if a person has a chronic illness, which means by definition, they have low voltage and low oxygen, can almost uh, uh, bet the farm that uh, they also have Lyme disease. And that uh, one of the problems with the Lyme bacteria is that it sheds its cell membrane, enters inside a cell and curls up like a little bear in a cave and sits there inside the cell where antibiotics can get to it. And so the only way really that you can get to these bacteria that are inside the cells is to use again an oxidative therapy or a frequency therapy to get rid of them. So the point is that uh, the majority of people who have chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia will also have Lyme disease and one wants to address that um, with the technologies that I've mentioned in order to eliminate that and help the, that toxic load be eliminated from the body and uh, finally you can uh, then uh, get more quickly uh, normalize the voltage and the oxygen levels. So the other thing I would mention is that it's almost impossible to get through life without having emotional baggage. Who of us have not had emotional things happen? Essentially all of us. But now add in chronic illness, add in the fact that you feel bad every day, that you hurt every day, that you have trouble going to work, that you have trouble enjoying your family, enjoying life, enjoying much of anything, that in and of itself is an overwhelming emotion. And so essentially everybody who has a chronic illness, but particularly chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, uh, carries the additional emotional baggage on top of whatever else one might have and as we've discussed, emotions uh, uh, in the body are magnetic fields that are, uh, and people don't want to hear those 24 seven. So you build a wall around them so you don't have to hear them, but that wall blocks the circuit. So it's my belief that an integral part of getting anyone over chronic illness is to deal with the emotional baggage. And of course, uh, one of the things that Dr. Amy Marshall in my clinic has began to, to unravel and uh, develop the, the techniques of using basically scalar energy to tune emotional baggage into being just memories. And uh, for lack of time, I won't repeat how that's done here today, but we've discussed it in other sessions and you may want to review that. Uh, we find that it's absolutely critical in dealing with people with chronic illnesses 
to deal with their emotional baggage. If you don't deal with it, you generally make people better, but you don't uh, get them to the place they want to be where they're really enjoying life. So that's kind of the things I wanted to share with you today about uh, the fact that in, in all chronic disease, you have to look at voltage because you have to have the energy to make cells work correctly and to be able to have the energy to make new cells when the old ones wear out or get damaged. You have to have the nutrition. You have to have all the parts it takes to make new cells because again, healing is all about making new cells that work. And then finally, you have to deal with the toxins uh, and the toxins, of course, includes the microorganisms we've talked about. It includes various other kinds of toxins like GMO foods, heavy metals, pesticides, the list goes on and on, uh, that you have to deal with the toxins that damage cells as fast as you make them. And if you uh, deal with all of those things, then you have the ability to get the body back to what I like to call factory settings. And so, um, with uh, that in mind, I would uh, encourage you to uh, begin to try to change your way of thinking again from assuming that, first of all, that there's a magic bullet that's going to make you well. There is no such thing. And also assuming that uh, you can just, that getting well is a one-shot thing that you go get magically treated and you're well and then you don't have to do anything else. What you need to realize is that that getting well and staying well is requires both education and commitment on the person involved. You have to be willing to change your lifestyle. You have to be willing to recognize what around you is an electron stealer that's lowering your voltage and to look at your diet and see that you're consuming things that are not electron stealers, but rather that are good for the body. And finally, uh, deal with your emotional health. Uh, so, um, uh, Amy, can you think of things that uh, I should be discussing uh, before we close? Yeah. Dr. Tennant, you're, you are, I don't even have the right words to say. It's, it's, it's amazing. You're, your words of wisdom and guys, I mean, this is just mind blowing to me because it, it, it truly, this is the basis of everything that we're all about. I mean, Dr. Tennant has laid the groundwork because of his own journey of healing, but it's just, you know, the way you need to think of this is, is a way of life and what he's discussed and, and that, you know, our body is like a breaker box in our house and that if we don't supply it the right voltage or if, it, if it's, having issues, you know, because of deficiencies, it's going to flip. Your, your breakers are going to blow and then you're, you're going to um, become to fatigue and ill and not feel good. And so it's, it is a way of life. I think it like, you know, brushing my teeth every day, it's, it's so important to make sure that we're doing these protocols to ensure we feel great. So thank you, Dr. Tennant. It, you put things so poetically um, and beautifully said. So I, I'm so grateful for your wisdom. Guys, I, I just wanted to let you know, too, um, going forward, we are going to be doing um, not weekly calls, but every other week call or weekly, um, not weekly streams is what I mean, but every other week uh, stream so that you can view us and see us. Um, and additionally, next week is 4th of July, so we're going to be at the lake. Just kidding. But we will be uh, joining us again the following week. So I just didn't want you missing our faces and know that we are still here to support you. We are always here to guide you and be um, wisdom you know, for you in this health journey. So know that you're not alone and you can always reach out to us for support at the Tenet Institute and here at Synergy Medical Group. So one thing that we wanted to do is, as some of you know, it is Dr. Tennant's 80th birthday coming up. We wanted to wish him a happy birthday. So we're going to have everybody come in and sing happy birthday to you. Wow, <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you.
Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next time. Same place. Okay. Look forward to it. I might just uh, oh. make a, another comment. You know, sure. my grandpa and all of my uncles either died or had a heart attack by the age of 46. So when I was 46, guess what? I was a little apprehensive. I bet. But I got past that. And then, of course, I got sick again, had to quit work in 1995 and spent about seven years in bed trying to figure out how to get well, which led me to doing what I'm doing now. And so um, I would just point out that, you know, uh, day after tomorrow, I'll be 80. <laughs> so uh, it just I just point that out to show you that, yeah, this kind of works. It does. Your proof is in the pudding. <laughs> so, you know, here I am, 80 and still working and, and loving it and having fun. So thank you for your well wishes. Oh, thank you, Dr. Tennant. We appreciate it. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks again. All right. Bye.